So <clears throat> the program today is that I will start to tell you a little bit about the collaborative research program, Renewable Transportation Fuels and System. And then uh, uh, Maria Rydberg will talk about Swedish Life Cycle Center. And then we will hear more about the results from this specific project that we are all gathered around today. And as a short introduction, Ebba Tam, who has uh, been part of this uh, project, will give a short introduction first, and then the researchers Sofia and Thomas will make the presentations, and then the questions and discussions uh, in the end. So my name is Ingrid Nolgren, and I am director for F3, the Swedish Knowledge Center for Renewable Transportation Fuels. And then I'm also responsible for the program office for the collaborative research program, Renewable Transportation Fuels and Systems. And the, that uh, research program is a research program run by the Swedish Energy Agency together with F3. And the, the research that is carried out within this uh, program is system oriented and interdisciplinary uh, research and it's uh, get, uh, focused on the renewable transportation fuels. And questions that we are uh, studying is related to resources and raw material, uh, sustainability of different fuels, uh, different production systems for fuels, uh, infrastructure questions, and policy instruments. And when we talk about renewable transport fuels, uh, it's a wide perspective. Um, it includes both biofuels, renewable electricity, renewable hydrogen, and renew uh, electrofuels produced from renewable electricity. And we have several different tools to reduce climate impact in the transport sector uh, and all are, are very important. So we have the more efficient fuels, we have to work on that, we have to reduce the transport need and we have to have as good renewable fuels as possible. And uh, even if all three is very important in this research program, we only focus on the renewable fuels. And the, the, um, the, the purpose with the program is that we will find research or get research results and knowledge that can lead to better decisions, better decisions for politicians, authorities and, and industries and companies. This program has uh, carried, been carried out for uh, four years now, uh, and before that we had another uh, three or four years. Uh, so we now in the final part of this, um, this period, uh, we have had 26 projects of which nine are finished and you can read their final reports on our website. The remaining 17 uh, will be finished within the coming months. The total budget for these projects have been around 47 million Swedish crowns. So I think all of you know what Energimyndigheten or the Swedish Energy Agency, what that is, what that is but F3, uh, some of you might not know what F3 is, so I will just say some words about that. Uh, in F3, industry, academia, uh, research institutes and authorities collaborate for a sustainable transport sector. And uh, we do that by building and disseminate knowledge about renewable fuels. We have three pillars. Um, we fund uh, research projects and implement uh, research projects together with the Swedish Energy Agency in this collaborative program I just told you about. And then we put a lot, a lot of focus on um, collaboration within F3 with the different actors um, within F3 and, uh, and then external communication <clears throat> to spread the results from the research and our funding. Um, the partners within F3 at the moment are um, five universities, Chalmers, SLU, 
Lund uh, KTH, and then Bio for Energy, which is which is a collaboration between Umeå University and uh, Luleå University. And then we have the three research institutes, IVL, RISE, and v VTI. And uh, the industry partners are the fuel producers such as Neste, SD1, Prim, uh, Lantmännen, and uh, it says E on he here, and uh, uh, that represents the biogas part of E.ON, which is now part of ST1. And then we have the, the vehicle producers, Scania and Volvo. And center host is uh, Chalmers Industri Teknik. Uh, and as I said, we collaborate with the Swedish Energy Agency, but we also collaborate with um, the region of Västra Götaland which are um, uh, funding some of our network activities and uh, communication efforts. So um, if you have any questions uh, regarding the collaborative program, uh, research program or uh, F3, you can contact me. And I also encourage you to uh, sign up um, for our newsletter and then you can get all the information about the coming uh, results that um, will come from the projects that ends in, within the coming months and then follow us on LinkedIn. So <clears throat> with that, that was all that I was going to say. So please, Maria, uh, try to take control. <laughs> yes, thank you. All right, uh, so my name is Maria Rydberg and I work as a project manager at Swedish Life Cycle Center. Uh, and I will give a, a brief background about Swedish Life Cycle Center because we have had a co coordinative role within uh, uh, the ICOM project that you will get results from uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so we are a national competence center and a collaboration platform for academia, industry, research institutes, and government agencies and our aim is to uh, work for credible and applied life cycle thinking globally. Uh, so we work for the integration of the life cycle perspective into processes and decision making in industry, government policy and also other parts of society. And the increased application of the life cycle perspective uh, leads to increased resource efficiency that enhances sustainable uh, production and consumption patterns. Also, uh, new innovations and a sustainable circular economy. The life cycle perspective also opens up for possibilities to working towards our common sustainability challenges and uh, sustainable development goals. We are a partner-driven collaboration. Uh, we started 25 years ago, 1996. And we are hosted by uh, Chalmers University of Technology. And within the collaboration, we have 16 partners uh, and also nine government agencies that are collaborating with the center. Partners on the left and agencies on the right side. Uh, and we also just open up for small and medium sized enterprises to enter our collaboration with a special, special SME agreement, uh, which we are very excited about. At the moment, our network involves over 500 life cycle professionals that are working in some way uh, with um, life cycle thinking within their uh, daily operations. One of our key uh, issues is to create a neutral platform for cross-sector solutions, because as you see, our partners are from um, a few different indus in, uh, industries. Uh, and to be able to have that, we need to work with transparency and trust. So that is important for us uh, who works at the center to create that kind of uh, platform where we can um, um, have the, um, the trust so we can be transparent with, with each other uh, because that uh, gives us uh, the opportunity to create better projects. 
and uh, the room for other organizations. So if you're interested in what it means and what benefits there are in being a partner, uh, please contact us. Very brief about our way of work. Uh, looking at the figure on the right side, we are in one of these dots now in the webinars and seminars dots. Uh, but our focus is to obtain tools and inspiration uh, for new strategies and working processes uh, to implement within the operations of our partners. We also work a lot with networking and increasing knowledge, uh, both, both uh, um, uh, through close contact with other experts within the life cycle field, and also uh, with providing courses and opportunities for, for education. And of course, uh, we are a lot about collaboration uh, because we think that we can make a larger impact uh, both through our research projects and uh, within other joint efforts where we can influence uh, national and international in initiatives. And since we are at the end of this year, uh, I just want to mention some of the uh, exciting things that we are looking forward to. Beginning really big, uh, we are entering a new stage. Uh, our center is running stages of three years, and we are now entering a new stage with fresh eyes, updated focus areas, and new ideas on how to work for credible and applied life cycle thinking globally. And of course, uh, this is a project that is ending, uh, but we have some new and exciting projects that are just about to start or just have started. Uh, just want to mention one. We have a project called ASSIST uh, that we look into how to effectively collect LCA data from suppliers that have just started. And last but not least, uh, in April, we will give our popular two-day course uh, in applied life cycle thinking. Uh, and if you're interested in taking uh, the course, uh, you can visit our website and register your, your interest there. No. <laughs> That was too fast. <laughs> uh, so I mentioned the website, uh, and that is a great way to find more information about us. But there are also other ways to keep in touch with us. LinkedIn, newsletter, or a regular email uh, works just fine uh, as well. And with that, thank you for your attention. And back to Ingrid. So uh, let's see if I have the control again. Hmm. It looks like I have the control, but I can't. So now we are coming to um, the part when we will hear more about this project. And first, um, some questions for you, Ebba Tam at uh, Drikraft Sverige. Are you with us? Yes, I am. Good, then the yeah. technique is working. So yeah. uh, why did uh, Drikraft uh, Sverige choose to be a part of this project? And, and why was it important for you, this project? Well, uh, Drikra Sverige is a national uh, industry organization for fuel companies. And uh, we have great interest in biofuels and, uh, and LCA, or to be correct, the well to wheel is a very important part of the sustainability criteria for renewable fuels. And um, we frequently get questions on, on, you know, to do LCAs, but we are very much run by the legislation about the uh, renewable fuels and the LCAs. And I thought that if you do this uh, type of, uh, well, um, studies in comparison with others, you can find and get inspiration because the Renewable Energy Directive, which states uh, how you do the calculation is up for revision. And there might be some learnings from this project to, to feed into that um, uh, process and uh, actually, uh, the the possibility to actually influence something is now. Yeah. Good. And uh, so what did you learn from this project? What sort of new knowledge will you uh, 
continue to work with or what was the most important result for you? Well, I haven't yet read the whole report and I was waiting for the report from here, but uh, I, I think uh, that um, things has been changing in the renewable energy directive and um, I, I, I'm not an expert on the LCAs, but I hope to find some information and listen to the presentations today to see if there are anything that we can take with us and influence uh, to change. Because in the legislation, the devil's in the details and we've changed changes that we're not too happy about because it takes away some investments that some of our member companies have done. And, and um, that is really serious when you change uh, the rules uh, during the game, I would say. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much, uh, Ebba. And uh, then we will get to the project. Just first, uh, maybe a little bit more details on the project when, uh, before I give the word to Sofia and Thomas. Uh, it's actually Thomas Rydberg at EVL uh, who has been the project manager. And uh, besides Sofia and Thomas uh, who are presenting here today, um, we have had other participants in this project. So Sara Palander, Miguel Brandau and Katarina Lorenzon. The project is ending now and started uh, in June last year. Uh, and uh, as co-founders uh, for this pro project, um, besides the Swedish Energy Agency and F3 partner organizations and, and Drivkraft Sverige, who we just heard, uh, there are a lot of uh, other uh, companies who have partly funded this project as well. So <clears throat> with that, um, Please, uh, Sofia and Thomas. I think it's Sofia who starts, and Thomas yes. will join. So please take control of the presentation. Yes, uh, let's see if that will work. Fine. Uh, yes, I just approved test. it. Great. So um, thank you and uh, welcome everyone to this presentation. Uh, thank you, Ingrid and Maria, for your kind introduction, and also Ebba for your reflections. So now we will uh, continue with our uh, specific reflections and results of this project. Uh, the, the formal name is Impacts on Fuel Producers and Customers on Conflict in the Rules for LCA. We, our life cycle assessment, we like to call it ICOM project. Uh, my name is Sofia. I work at IVL, Swedish Environmental Research Institute, and I have the honor to present the project today uh, together with Thomas Ekvall. But uh, we should also mention and acknowledge that there was a broad uh, group of researchers from different institutions who really worked and contributed to this uh, work. So, yes. So the agenda for today, we'll start with a short introduction about the project and overview of three different uh, life cycle assessment frameworks that we have been looking at or analyzing in this work. We have the Renewable Energy Directive, uh, Environmental Product Declarations and Product Environmental Footprint. Uh, and then we will present some case studies that we performed, um, mention them briefly, but we will focus more on the key findings and uh, results of this work. Starting with some introduction and motivation behind this project, as uh, Ebba also mentioned before, the use of life cycle assessment or life cycle related information is increasing among decision making. And we have seen that across different sectors and industries that uh, the request for life cycle assessment is, um, is used in various uh, contexts. So both for internal uh, purposes, internal in an organization for uh, product development activities or setting goals, for example, but also externally uh, for uh, communication with customers, but also for um, communication with uh, authorities and reporting to authorities. Uh, and all the different contexts might require the application of different methodological approaches, different LCA frameworks or different um, um, tools to be applied that may also vary in scope, boundaries or data demands. And you see some examples listed or highlighted in the right side. Uh, our hypothesis in this project was that uh, this broad um, uh, view or this broad uh, methodological uh, approaches may result in increased need of uh, resources for the industry or for the practitioner in terms of budget or expertise. Uh, variations also in outcome and conclusions, they might lead to variations in outcome and conclusions, and eventually that can create some confusion among the actors. That was also something that Ebba uh, lifted before. 
So the aim uh, was first to uh, increase understanding of the different uh, life cycle frameworks available and uh, also discuss to what extent the different, uh, the multitude of these frameworks give conflicting recommendations in relation to environmental improvements. Then of course, we want to uh, specifically uh, mention a few um, uh, suggestions on how those challenges can be addressed. And by the end, we aim also to uh, make all actors, not only the ones involved in the project, but also externally, uh, those who are listening today, to uh, be more actively part uh, and influence the efforts to harmonize LCA uh, work or LCA frameworks. Uh, our focus on this project has been on the fuel uh, producing um, industry, uh, as we are also funded by the F3 Center and the Energy Agency in Sweden. Uh, so we have been working on case studies on different tra transport fuels and apply the three different frameworks, uh, the Renewable Energy Directive, the Environmental Product Declaration and Product Environmental Footprint, as I mentioned before. And very briefly, I will go through those three different uh, frameworks as a very short introduction. Uh, I'll start with the Renewable Energy Directive, that is something that is very familiar and common among the uh, fuel industry or the transport sector. Uh, the Renewable Energy Directive is not really a life cycle assessment um, framework or methodology as such, but it has a life cycle uh, perspective. Uh, it sets the sustainability and greenhouse gas emissions criteria for the biofuels or bioliquids used in the transport sector. And it provides a formula on how those um, greenhouse gas emissions should be uh, calculated. So a very specific formula that also in integrates uh, all different stages of the life cycle of the, uh, of the fuel, of the production pathway of the fuel. Uh, and this is a very important uh, tool, of course, for the uh, industry, uh, the, the specific industry that we are looking at, so we have uh, included it in our work. Uh, another emerging term that is more and more, um, it's coming up more and more uh, to discussions across different sectors, might not be so uh, familiar in the transport sector yet, but other sectors have definitely adopted it more. Uh, it's the Environmental Product Declaration. And Environmental Product Declaration is a verified or registered document that communicates the environmental performance of a product. Uh, the method or general rules are described in um, general product instructions or product category rules that specify uh, guidelines and requirements for different product categories. And there are different program operators uh, across the world that uh, these documents can be registered. And in this work, we have been focusing or uh, looking on the documents provided by the IPD International, that is a Swedish program operator. Uh, and finally, we have Product Environmental Footprint, or PEF. Uh, this is an effort coordinated by the European Commission, uh, started in a few years ago, and there are also a few pilot studies performed uh, in terms of PEF to develop and promote this, this uh, method. Uh, it builds on, uh, on yeah, common LCA guidelines and uh, standards, and it also has the generic recommendation um, guidelines, but also um, there should be product environmental footprint category rules specific for product categories, uh, specific, specific rules for different product categories. And I should mention that apart from the Renewable Energy Directive, um, neither EPD or PEF has um, had available uh, PCRs or PEFCRs specifically for uh, transport fuels that we could look. So we uh, make our assessments based on the generic guidelines available. Um, and this table summarizes a few parameters that we think it's important when comparing or discussing the different fuels, and I'll try to navigate you uh, shortly in those. Uh, starting with the purpose of the different methods, as we already saw or uh, mentioned before, um, they have different purposes. I mean, for EPD and PEF, it's important, uh, communication is important, and also harmonization within their own context. Um, uh, to find a transparent and harmonized way to conduct an LCA, uh, and also the audience then it's more about business to business or business to customer communication. When it comes to uh, renewable energy directive, this is a regular, uh, regulatory document. Uh, it, uh, it's more about compliance uh, reporting. So the intended audience, it's national or EU authorities. But of course the results from RED, it's used for other purposes as well. Uh, all three methods have a life cycle perspective or a cradle to grave perspective, indicating that all um, per, um, well, all processes uh, involved in the life cycle of a, a fuel production uh, and use will be included in the system. But that, of course, can vary depending a little bit on the uh, on the specific case, as we will also see later on. Uh, an important parameter uh, often uh, addressed in life cycle assessment is about multifunctional processes. And with multifunctional processes, we 
uh, we mean processes that create or uh, produce more than the, um, the the product under assessment, the one that we want to analyze. And this often creates uh, confusion and there are different ways to, to deal with this uh, type of um, uh, multifunctional uh, processes. Uh, the Renewable Energy Directive is quite straightforward in their approach. Uh, what is uh, suggested there is allocation based on the energy content of the different co-products. Uh, in the case of EPD and PEF, there is um, some type of uh, hierarchy or decision um, or different options available. Um, EPD is more towards uh, allocation or expanding the level of detail of the study, while in the case of PEF, we have seen that it can be um, a system of expansion or, um, sorry, um, or um, substitution can also be an alternative. Uh, so in these two uh, frameworks, EPD or PEF, there is some room for interpretation, especially if an, um, a PCR or a PFCR is not uh, available. Another important factor uh, is about the type of feedstock and the type of raw materials used in the system. Uh, so for example, recycled or reused materials. Um, so materials that, um, that waste or residues that become feedstock in the case of uh, biofuel production. This is very common, especially nowadays when it comes to biofuel or transport fuels. Uh, the PEF has a very um, has a, a circular uh, footprint formula. Uh, that should be applied, and we will also hear a bit more about that formula later on, uh, which defines a little bit the, the way that the environmental impact should be allocated between the uh, first life cycle of the material and the uh, second life cycle of the material. Uh, in the case of red, um, waste and other residues should be considered to have zero emissions from upstream processes um, to up to the collection. So it will only the collection and related uh, production activities only included in the, uh, in the system. Uh, finally, in relation to what those methods can communicate and what type of information they can provide, uh, the Renewable Energy Directive is also quite limited in scope. It includes only greenhouse gas emissions and the impact of climate change, uh, while the other two methods may offer a broader um, perspective. So having a broader list of impact categories that can be um, calculated and communicated to uh, external uh, partners. So in the case of PEF, we have six in default impact categories uh, or seven default impact categories for the case of EPD, but there's of course additional ones often um, included in specific PCRs. So by that, uh, I will just mention a little bit about the case studies that we have looked at and we applied those three different frameworks in each of them. Uh, we tried to have a variety of, of materials and feedstocks and processes used uh, in our project. So we had um, dedicated crops. So um, it's for example, from rapeseed oil or ethanol from corn that are the more traditional uh, base uh, biofuels, but also advanced biofuels uh, as for example, HCO from used cooking oil or ethanol from uh, residues like sodas or broad waste. But we also looked into biogas and pyrolysis oil from used tile. That was also a very uh, interesting um, production pathway. And by that, we will continue to the results of our uh, project. And I will leave the word to Thomas and give him um, control so that he can uh, continue with the slides. Thank you, Lord. My name is uh, Thomas Ekvall, and I'm a researcher and consultant in methods for environmental assessments. I'm also an adjunct professor in um, environmental systems analysis at Chalmers. So I'll try to get control of this presentation. Um, we applied the three frameworks for on each of these uh, fuels and, and we got uh, different results depending on, on the um, framework. And that is because um, of the different calculations, calculation rules specified by the frameworks for modeling of the waste management, the land use, how to deal with co-products, and how to model the electricity supply. Also, we've, we found that there is significant room for interpretation of the frameworks and uh, freedom of choice of methods, particularly in the PEF framework, work, but also in the EPT framework. And this means that you can't compare uh, a case study, a PEF, with an EPD, for instance, or with uh, calculations from the red, but you, it's also, um, you should also not compare uh, different 
PEF results from different studies because they could have been made with different methods. So <clears throat> waste, the modeling of waste management is, is uh, very important in several of our cases because several of the, of the fuels are produced from waste. Uh, land use, how to model land use is important for the results, particularly when, when we have fuels produced from dedicated crops. And how to deal with the co-products uh, are important when the fuels have important co-products. And these are often uh, fuels produced from dedicated crops. So, so these two uh, modeling areas, they, they are kind of integrated in our case studies. And then the electricity supply is important if, if the fuel production use a lot of electricity. Uh, and biofuel production rarely use a lot of electricity. So in most of our cases, the electricity supply is not that important, but it can be important when you have very little other emissions uh, from the fuel production. And it can also be, and it is also important for the pyrolysis uh, where you use a lot of electricity. I give a case of, uh, of <clears throat> the significance of modeling waste management and how this is different from different uh, in the different frameworks. Particularly the, the PEF framework is different from uh, the RED and the PD framework in that um, when you use a recycled material or a recovered energy, you carry part of the burdens of the virgin production. And when it comes to, to material recycling, such as the recycling of, of used cooking oil, then the recycled material carries up to 50, up to half the burdens of, of the production of uh, the substituted virgin uh, materials. So in this case, you can see the PEF uh, system boundary includes a mix of rapeseed and palm oil, the virgin production on that, which is substituted by, in our calculations, by the uh, pre-treated used cooking oil, the cocoa. And this results in a much higher, this, um, means that the results from, from PEF will be much higher than the results from the RED and, and EPD uh, calculations. And uh, the results from the PEF calculations will also depend uh, quite a bit on what is substituted by the used cooking oil. Uh, we assumed a mix with, of half, half rapeseed oil and half palm oil in our calculations. But we do also did a sensitivity analysis, uh, looking at um, the pr when when what happens if if the used cooking oil displaces only rapeseed oil uh, or only palm oil, and you can see if the it, if it substitutes only palm oil, and half the palm oil production is allocated to the to the HVO then the uh, climate impact of the HVO is close to the climate impact of, of uh, fossil fuel. So this is, uh, this, uh, what is substituted is uh, very important in the PEF. And what virgin material production is substituted, that depends also on where the substitution occurs. Here we assume that the pre-treated uh, used cooking oil displaces virgin oil, virgin oil, but we could also, instead we could have assumed that the HVO based on used cooking oil displaces used HVO produced from virgin raw materials. So you have a, the point of substitution is later in, in the uh, production chain. Or you could even assume uh, that the uh, HVO displaces fossil diesel. This is, I mean, this is the, the point of, of producing the HVO. Um, and then um, if, the, if fossil diesel is what is uh, 
substituted in the PEF model, then uh, it, the HVO carries half the production of fossil diesel. You could even, you could even, I think, say that that the production, the the transportation with HVO displaces transportation with a with a diesel truck, and then uh, the HVO transportation carries half the burdens of the production and use of, of fossil diesel. So the point of substitution is a bit difficult to identify in a PEF and it can have a significant impacts on the results. Another example is from the biogas produ produced from food waste. Here, uh, biogas is modeled not as as a case of material recycling, but as a case of energy recovery. And then PEF says that the biogas should carry all of the burdens of substituted virgin production instead of the production of the biogas. So the PEF does not, a PEF calculation does not include the biogas production, but instead the production of the virgin uh, the primary energy that is substituted by the biogas. And here we have even assumed that, that uh, the, the point of substitution is at the transportation. So we have not included the biogas use, nor the production, nor the use of the biogas, but instead the production and use of natural gas, which we which, you, which then in our model is what is substituted by the, by the biogas. So this means that uh, biogas is modeled as if it were uh, natural gas. You can see also uh, there is a difference between the red and EPD framework in this case, and that, in, that difference is important because the EPD framework does, does not allocate any emissions from the biogas production, from the digestion to the biogas, but it's all allocated to the food. While in the red framework, the biogas production is allocated and considered part of the biogas uh, production chain. This means that the um, EPD results that does not include that would not include any emissions from the digestion. They are quite low, uh, and the PEF results, if you, if we assume that if we model uh, the biogas instead as natural gas, then the the uh, climate impact is is very high. But this is if the point of substitution is uh, located at the transportation. If it's instead, if you say, in say, instead say that the biogas substitutes uh, natural gas when fed into the grid or at the tank station, then the model of the biogas will include production of natural gas, but combustion of biogas. And you have a PEF result, which is comparable to the red to the to the uh, results from the red directive. So these are two examples of how the modeling of waste management differs between the two between the three frameworks. When it comes to uh, land use, that is important. Because, because the frameworks all include the climate impact of land use change. And when you have uh, an, a co-product, like in this case with uh, ethanol from corn, you have a co-product that is dried distillers grains with solubles, solubles that is used for feed, animal feed. Then, all three, 
all three um, frameworks say that you can allocate part of the uh, of the impacts of cultivation and part of the impact of processing to this feed. And only and, and then the ethanol carries the rest of, of the cultivation impacts of cultivations and, and, and processing. And you can allocate uh, this in this uh, these burdens in different ways. Red two says that you should allocate in allocate the, the impacts and burdens and impacts in proportion to the energy content of the ethanol and the and the grains. APD says that you should also allocate, but you can, can choose allocation freely as long as you don't have detailed rules for, for how to do this in, in a biofuel uh, production chain. Uh, so to make uh, EPD, different EPDs comparable, uh, you, would need, you would need more detailed rules on, on how to deal with this allocation problem. also allows for for different uh, allocation methods and in addition you can expand the system to account for what is substituted by this by this by these grains and when we did this we saw that probably they displace uh, soybean meal in animal feeding and uh, and then uh, in the PEF can can be expanded to include the avoided uh, cultivation and processing of soy, soybeans. And um, then the PEF results will be much lower than the red or EPD results. However, soybean soybean meal is produced co-produced with so with soy oil and you can expand the system boundary to account for this so if you have less soybeans produced less soybean oil produced then you would need some other vegetable oil and in our model we we add production of palm oil and the palm oil has uh, quite a quite a large impact in from land use change uh, which means that the PEF results then becomes greater, higher than the results from red and EPD. So you can see that um, the PEF framework allows for great freedom here on in what methods to choose. And if you also, if you do use a sub, uh, ex system expansion with substitution, the results will be highly affected by what you assume is is or what is substituted. So uh, clearly, it's it's um, problematic to compare uh, PEF with an with an EPD or EPD results or with Red Two results, uh, and in general, you can also it's also problematic to to uh, compare PEF results from different studies, and um, and in general, and even more general, it's difficult to come and problematic co to compare results from different LCA studies. And this is because LCA is not a method, as I see it. Instead, LCA is a family of methods, and what results you you will get depends on on what specific methods you apply. This is not this is this is as it should be, I'd say, because different methods produce different kinds of information. So, uh, what question you ask will can go govern what methods you use, and and then what results you will have. Two important groups of methods in LCA are the attributional and consequential LCA, where uh, attributional LCA uh, aims to, to um, investigate or estimate what part of the global burdens, the global environmental burdens should be assigned to the product, this product that we're um, 
doing the LCA on. While the consequential LCA instead says, asks, what, how is the global environmental impacts affected by the production and use of this fuel? And as you can see from these illustrations, the, the numerical results are likely to be very different. And in and you can say that red two, uh, red and and the EPD framework, they are both attributional frameworks, although with slight variations. And the PEF framework is a mix of attributional and consequential LCA with a great deal of flexibility in it. And this flexibility can be reduced by specifying de more detailed rules on how to, to do the calculations in a PEF of biofuel. So that's what I wanted to say. And I leave, leave the control again to Sofia. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Let's see if that works. Um, and with that, uh, we will now uh, summarize it and and uh, yeah, list our main conclusions. Uh, so as we saw from what uh, Thomas presented also, that the methods that we looked at contain fundamental differences. And uh, in general, there are different levels. There are different levels of uh, development, maturity, and adoption. And by maturity, I mean more of an uh, example of case studies or example of uh, studies that have been using the specific frameworks. Um, in certain situations, they can lead to conflicting results or different results that also lead into uh, different uh, directions uh, in, in terms of decision making. Um, applying a framework like EPD or PEF, uh, in addition to RED2, uh, specifically for the uh, transport industry or the fuel producing industry, would uh, require significant efforts. Uh, not only because of the different rules applied and often which are often of course cont contradicting or difficult to interpret in, in certain cases uh, but also because of additional data and reporting requirements because there are, as we also saw there are different um, levels of impact categories included and different aspects to be communicated uh, but of course this did not discourage the, the sector of um, of investigating and trying to apply those methods on the contrary i think it uh, it's worth uh, uh, well, to to yeah take this initiative and try to apply more methods than the renewable energy directive, of course, uh, to have a broader or holistic perspective. Uh, but essentially, what we have identified also is that, uh, or what the project stresses, is that there is a need for support and for more information, especially in the re in relation to the other two uh, frameworks, um, and there is a need for PCR or PFCR specific product category rules. Uh, for the renewable fuels or for fuels in general. And also uh, when it comes to the product environmental footprint and as the carbon footprint formula uh, plays such a specific role um, or such an important role, uh, specific guidelines are very important. Uh, as Thomas mentioned, I mean, all methods cannot really uh, be performed in the same way. Uh, so harmonizing all the methods to be identical would be maybe difficult, but what we stress is that uh, what is important is that our actors are informed, that uh, we are aware of those differences. Uh, of course, we try to reduce them. I think what we can try to reduce within the same context of method or the same group of methods, it's this room for interpretations and that uh, can be reduced by specific rules. Um, but as I said, it's important that we are informed and that we know those differences and that we know what every result that we see represents at the end. And uh, yes, by that, uh, we'd like to close this presentation and uh, special, send a special thanks to all the project members, uh, not only the research partners, but also the industrial partners uh, that has been uh, supporting us throughout this work. And of course, uh, oh, sorry. Well, thank you all of you for your attention and we are happy to answer your questions. So <clears throat> now, Ingrid, yeah, you have. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Sofia and Thomas, for a very interesting presentation.